Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CSIS, uh, KU GSIS Roundtable. Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, I don't have to apologize, but uh, <laughs> you know, on behalf of Victor Cha you know, for being late. Uh, as you know, uh, thanks for coming uh, despite uh, the high vacation season uh, to this uh, very uh, interesting meeting. Uh, we have a, a very special guest uh, for today uh, from CSIS, uh, Center for Strategic uh, and International Studies, uh, which is a uh, world-class uh, foreign policy uh, think tank, as you know. Um, they are uh, U.S.-Korea, uh, U.S.-Korea next generation uh, scholars. Here the key word is uh, next generation. Okay, Being a next generation means uh, they are uh, fresh-minded, uh, they are armed with uh, uh, new technology and uh, new methodologies, and uh, most importantly, they are uh, ready to, uh, or getting ready to uh, replace uh, you know, old generations like Victor and myself. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, they are here finally, and I look, look forward to uh, your uh, active uh, participation. Uh, I think uh, after listening uh, to their own uh, respective presentation. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Victor Cha, uh, who is my uh, two decades old friend, and uh, he serves as a Korea chair at the CSIS and also uh, is a professor of international relations at the Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Please welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Sangha, for that introduction. I'm, um, I'm, I am a professor at Georgetown, but I have a new job starting in the fall. I'm going to be the vice dean at Georgetown, so I'm never going to do research for the next three years. <laughs> okay. There's so many administrative responsibilities. Um, but um, uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Professor Kim Sanghan and his colleagues for organizing this session. It, this is an incredible turnout for uh, the middle of the summer. I really do appreciate it and apologize um, for being late. Um, <clears throat> the Next Gen Scholar Program is a program that is now in its sixth year. Um, it is co-run co by uh, CSIS and the University of Southern California Korea Studies Institute. Um, as we speak now, the other half of our next-gen class is at uh, Seoul National University doing exactly the same thing, although they probably got there on time, because we had much further to go um, from where our first meeting was. Um, the next-gen scholars, as uh, Sangan mentioned, are um, uh, academics that are all really in the beginning of their career in the academy. Um, we do, an, we do a competition, an international competition, where we invite scholars to apply. Uh, and then this, this, for this class, we picked 10. Uh, thankfully, they all said yes. Um, and um, they are all, as you will see, people from very different fields. They're not all, some of them are political scientists. Some of them are not political scientists. Some of them work specifically on Korea. Some people, only a part of their work is, is focused on Korea. But in many of these cases, they are the only person who does any work remotely related to Korea at their university, in the city in which their university resides, in the state in which their university resides, and maybe in that entire time zone. They may be the only person working on Korea. In which case, if there is news on Korea, and there is always news on Korea, um, the local NPR station, the local radio station, the university will want to talk to someone on Korea, and it usually ends up being one of these people. So while we, um, part of our program is to encourage them to do their research, and we have an academic mentoring part of this that is designed to try to help them navigate um, the path to tenure. Um, the other part of that is to help them become better public policy scholars. Uh, in, in addition to their research. <clears throat> and so the way we do that is the, we do three meetings. The first meeting was in Washington, D.C. last winter, where uh, we brought the scholars to Washington and we took them 
to various places um, to meet with policymakers. So they were at the White House, they were at the State Department, intelligence agencies, Capitol Hill. Um, <clears throat> then the second meeting took place this past spring in Los Angeles at USC, um, where we had them work with uh, journalists on how to write an op-ed, write an opinion piece. And then also with the Annenberg School of Communications, uh, how to do television, how to do uh, media interviews on television. The last and the most important part of the trip is to Korea this summer, uh, where they are, they've met uh, a number of officials. They, we will go to the Blue House this afternoon. They were at the uh, US Embassy yesterday, uh, the Foreign Ministry, the Defense Ministry, the Unification Ministry. Uh, they had dinner with Korean journalists, uh, and um, tonight they had dinner with the senior advisors to the project, uh, which include people like uh, Kim Sung Han and Lee Sin Hwa and, and other uh, academics, so that senior academics here in Korea, the sort of thought leaders here in Korea, can also meet them. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the program. We're very proud of our of our. Next Gen Scholars. This is the third class of Next Gen Scholars. Uh, we tell each class they're the best class. So this class is the best class of Next Gen Scholars. And I thought if it's okay, uh, Sanan, what we do is have them each say a little bit about themselves and the sort of research they're doing, and then we'll just open up for a, for a discussion, if that's okay. So, yeah, so thank you all for coming, and then um, we'll be, the, the scholars will introduce themselves to you, and then we can discussion. Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, let me moderate uh, the roundtable uh, session. Uh, if you look at the agenda, uh, the brilliant bio of those uh, five next-gen scholars uh, you know, are there. So you may uh, refer to uh, those uh, bios, uh, which means uh, uh, I'm not going to read uh, their uh, bios. So without further ado, uh, uh, let me uh, start uh, the round table uh, from uh, Katrine Fraser Katz, uh, who will be briefly introducing yourself uh, and then uh, explain uh, about uh, your topic for about uh, five to 10 minutes. Thank you. you no, wherever you, yeah, yeah. Um, as, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, and thank you for um, hosting us here today and for your attention, because I'm um, you know, sure there are other things you all could be doing on this uh, very this summer day, not raining. Um, we're all very happy to be here as well. I'm um, uh, Katrin Katz, and I'm currently an adjunct fellow uh, at CSIS, but based in New York. So this year I'll be teaching at Columbia University. Um, and so, yes, I'm happy to share a little bit about my recent research. I don't want to go into too much detail because I'll leave it, you know, any questions or things you're interested in kind of hearing more about in the Q&A. Um, but I'll try to give a kind of an overview of the things I've been thinking about and then look forward to hearing from, from you all later. So um, at the broadest level, I've been looking at conflict patterns in Northeast Asia. Um, the periodic uh, rise and fall in tensions uh, with you know, nationalist charged issues um, that we all know well about in this room. Um, it's a quite unique pattern that uh, has its own name, uh, hot economics, cold politics. Um, the reason I've, I've honed in on this, and empirically in my dissertation work I look at the island disputes, but I'm really interested more generally in a number of se sensitive topics that can Kick, up, kick off these episodes of contention. Um, the reason I focused on um, these issues is for two reasons. Um, one, academically, prominent IR theories don't explain them very well. Um, so I mean, some, some very well-known kind of intuitive theories like the commercial piece, the idea that um, economic partners should get along well, that, that helps to explain why these disputes don't escalate to war, but it doesn't explain well why they escalate at all among the key economic partners in the region. Um, secondly, uh, theories uh, about nationalism, the conventional wisdom around nationalism is that if leaders kick up nationalism, their hands are going to be tied by that. They're going to have a very hard time de-escalating tensions. And so the patterns in this region confound that because they show that there's, at least so far, been kind of a lid to tensions. 
um, in these disputes in the region. So as someone kind of from, from an academic perspective, um, looking at these patterns that have been um, quite regular in recent decades, um, considering that this is one of the regions with some of the world's largest economies and militaries, I think the academic field of IR could do better in explaining these patterns. And so from an academic perspective, that's what brought me here. But I also have a previous policy background and experience in the policy world, maybe the reverse order of um, most folks, but I did um, some posts in DC um, that brought me really to want to pursue further PhD studies. And from a policy perspective, when I worked on some of these issues at the NSC in particular, um, what was concerning was that the, the rise and fall in tensions is so regular that you can become somewhat complacent in the seat like in, in DC where you know what, what comes up is going to come down. And in fact, that's been pretty much the case. The US has been pretty, tries to be pretty hands off, has gotten involved at certain key moments, I think in a good way, in a helpful way. But the general idea is that you know, time will do its healing work. I mean, I'm quoting actually a scholar in some newspaper article that I thought captured the general sense that if you get involved, you might think that things make things worse. And, and over time, things should get better. So just you know, don't don't get involved. So the problem from that is that the world changes and dispute patterns change. And that if if that is our understanding of disputes from a Washington policymaker's perspective, then uh, someone in D.C. might not know when to worry and when to really engage because the interests at stake for the U.S. in this region are too important to not get engaged if we, if we have more troubling patterns going on. Unfortunately, I think we're in one of those moments right now in Japan-Korea relations where, where we should be worried, uh, where dispute chain patterns are changing. And I think that it's still, it's, it's too early for me to say how they're changing, but I think it's clear to everyone in this room who's well aware of you know, what I'm talking about with Japan and Korea, that things are changing. And so it's important, you know, if there's any value add that my work can have for, for policymakers, maybe it'll come too late. Um, it would be in trying to discern you know, where we came from and what exactly is changing now and therefore what we can do to get things back on track. Um, so that's just the broad sweep and overview of what brought me to this topic um, from both an academic and policy perspective. Um, I, in my work, in my dissertation, which I'm now hoping to make into a book, I, I generate a theory, which I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but, but generally I focus more on the domestic group aspects of these disputes looking at which groups are involved in both the escalation and the de-escalation phase of, of episodes of contention, both between Japan, Korea, and um, Japan and China. Um, so I won't go into that too much here, but that's been the empirical focus of my work, moving away from looking at broader structural patterns and ideational issues, which are also important, but honing in on um, group, uh, domestic group dynamics and roles. So just a few key takeaways and um, observations from my uh, work that might be relevant to the present moment I'll share and then I'll let my colleagues have you know, time to talk about their more interesting research. Um, so a few things that uh, might be useful today. Um, one, one thing that's clear right now is that business interests are involved in the escalation phase uh, of this uh, episode of contention between Japan and Korea, really for, for the first time in a real way. Um, so previous episodes between Japan and Korea on issues like Dokdo Islands and um, other contentious history issues have mostly involved symbolic issues in the escalation phase. Uh, important symbolic issues, one that the public publics care deeply about and should care deeply about, but symbolic and collective, which um, the mobilization dynamics of collective issues, if you all know something about collective action problem, these are quite different than when private interests are involved. So they do tend to fizzle out more over time because of the free rider problem and these, these other things. Um, so generally, symbolic interests have been on the side of escalation in the past, and that's been helpful in the de-escalation phase for leaders because they've been able to generate symbolic concessions to, to to tamp down tensions, not not concessions that made the issues go away, but things like uh, you know stopping or, or putting a, a near-term end to Yasukuni visits um, doesn't cost cost the Japanese leaders something in terms of maybe pol politically, but not materially economically. And symbolic concessions can be useful because both sides can they're sometimes vague enough that both sides can kind of frame them in a way that that provides a face-saving rationale for the public to back down. Um, so we're now in a space where economic issues are in the escalation phase. It's harder to de-escalate in a way an economic issue because it's very clear who loses 
and it's measurable who loses. But you know, there might be space in some way. I hope if we can buy some time here. I know today was a pretty troubling day in terms of things escalating more. But thinking about what's, what type of a symbolic issue, a symbolic trade might work, would be something to think about. Again, from my research. I don't know how that would look. But it's something to think about decompressing the very you know, concrete issues that are involved now. That my concern is that the nationalist theories that I talked about, with leaders' hands being tied, that we go more, more into that space where their hands are tied and they're really locked in. So one thought from my research and looking at the conflict patterns is that going back to some public concessions might be a useful thing if we have time and things are moving so fast right now and the implications are already compounding in terms of this, this, this escalation. But that's one thought. The second is that the quiet, the quiet forces of uh, business interests, export-oriented conglomerates and, and so forth, have, have played a quiet role in de-escalating these disputes in the past. Um, you know, once um, economic um, interests are affected, leaders have found a way to de-escalate. That's different now because we already have economic costs involved. But I, my sense is that, um, that the business interests remain on the side of cooperation, that they don't want to feel the pain of these escalations on either, in either Japan or Korea. And that, that goes for the US and international interests that are going to be affected as well. So the takeaway from that um, is that uh, I don't think business interests ever have an interest in being very vocal and out front in you know, prescribing policy. Their interests are in their bottom line of profits. Um, but to have, th that they remain, um, I think, I, I hope, a uh, important force in communicating through gov to government channels and with each other across countries. And also to, if they're going to have a public role, it's in articulating the costs here so that the broader publics do understand I think South Koreans well understand the implications of the export controls. I know watching news in recent days, it's, it's very clear. But within the Japanese public as well, within the US public as well, again, um, to, to alert people that this is a time to worry. Partic I'm talking about in the United States in particular. I think that'll become clear maybe before, uh, when it's too late, when we're already seeing um, the outcomes in terms of um, increased prices and it's from the, these you know, warped supply chains through these, um, these new uh, export control regulation or restrictions. Um, anyway, I, I will leave it there. I do, I do have some ideas about you know, things that the US could do to get more involved as well that tie to my research, but I want to leave it at that for now. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Stephanie Kim at Georgetown. Thank you, Dean Kim, and thank you to the staff and uh, to everyone here at Korea University for welcoming us this afternoon. Um, so my name is Stephanie Kim. I'm a faculty member at Georgetown University where I direct a master's program in higher education administration. Um, and so I am certainly by no means the, the sole Korean studies person in my institution or my, let alone my city. Um, I have the unenviable position of sharing the stage with Professor Cha <laughs> at Georgetown University. Um, but, but nonetheless, I approach the study of Korea perhaps from a, a different and somewhat novel angle than some of my colleagues here, uh, because my, my background is in education, and I am very much interested in issues of higher education. Uh, so my research sits at the intersection of higher education and migration studies. And so typically, uh, migration studies has been framed uh, typically in political and economic lenses. So we've seen a lot of studies on labor mobility, on refugees, uh, etc. Uh, but recently, there's been an interest in understanding migration through an education lens. Um, and specifically looking at the movement of students, uh, mostly those who move from south to north or from east to west uh, in pursuit of academic credentials and professional opportunities. And this discussion is primarily understood at the scale of the individual. So the individual aspirations of students that then drive them to pursue education overseas, or it's primarily understood at the scale of the nation state. So government policies that shape the movement of students and allow for their movement. Um, but what's sorely missing from this discussion is uh, the role of the institutions. So that is the universities themselves 
and how those universities uh, exercise various forms of agency as they themselves uh, face domestic challenges and look to global opportunities uh, in response. So primarily the aggressive recruitment of students from overseas. And that's where my own research comes in. And so I look at higher education reforms happening in both South Korea and the United States. Uh, from a US perspective, I look at how US universities are facing budget cuts and look to international students to make up for these revenue shortfalls, uh, international students who primarily come from Asian countries. And I'm, I'm sure uh, many, even many of you in this room have, might have uh, had some study abroad opportunities in the United States. And I also look at how Korean universities are facing d domestic demographic shifts, uh, primarily from the low birth rate, but also from the vast numbers of Korean students who go overseas, and how these universities negotiate these challenges through specific institutional reforms, initiatives, and programs. And so this is essentially the topic of the book project that I am currently writing now. Um, tentatively titled, From Berkeley to Seoul, How Higher Education Travels Across the World. And the book project looks at the movement of Korean students uh, between the, uh, South Korea and the United States uh, to come uncover the institutional mechanisms that allow for their movement in the first place. And it's framed under the thematic of traveling students, but really I, I'm I look at the, how institutional competition travels across national borders, and, and that is the crux of the book. I'm happy to discuss a little bit more during the Q&A, but for purposes of time, I will uh, keep it short and end it here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And our uh, next speaker is uh, ji Yong Ko at the Bates College. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today um, here today. So I'm an assistant professor at Bates College in Maine, so I think I'm the sole, um, the only Korean expert in Maine, actually. <laughs> and I'm a Korean University alumni, so I'm really happy to be yeah, back on the campus today. So my main uh, research area um, is popular nationalism and foreign policy. So what I mean by popular nationalism is, it's a kind of state um, in which the majority of citizens within the state have sentiments of, I mean, nationalistic, uh, some sort of like nationalistic sentiments. So my research um, looks at the relationship between popular nationalism and foreign policy, both at the micro and then state levels. So at the micro levels, I, I examine how nationalistic sentiments um, influence citizens' foreign policy attitude. So this research actually was motivated by like what happened between China and Japan in 2012 um, after the Japanese government announced the nationalization of um, disputed islands in the East China Sea. There was a huge nationalist protest across China and Chinese citizens displayed strong nationalist sentiments like feelings of superiority and then hostile feelings toward Japan and And previous research provides very little insights like what, like what the consequences of having those kinds of um, nationalist sentiments um, are. So my research builds on like studies in social psychology and, and explore how these sentiments um, form uh, various uh, psychological biases. So for example, like when people have feelings of superiority, like national superiority, people also tend to believe that their country is strong enough to um, win in a conflict or crisis with other countries. And the kind of uh, positive illusion about um, one, one's own nation states often leads to a preference for violence or hawkish approach in foreign policy. And at the same time, um, national sentiments can also generate like preference for um, complete victory in the international crisis, and and also induce like un un um, uncompromising attitude. So this is somehow related to like what Katrin says. So that's why like we typically believe that 
like leaders' hands are tied when they have nationalistic public at home. Um, so I built, I mean, so I, I explored this micro foundation um, in the first part of my project and building upon that, in the second part, I um, examine how popular nationalism actually influences leaders' decision to initiate like war, interstate war. So I agree with Katrin, I mean, that at the like low uh, level disputes, um, popular nationalism can um, increase the chance of escalation. But when it comes to actual like um, interstate war, um, I don't believe that popular nationalism is actually a major cause of interstate war. Um, there are two reasons for um, that. Like first, so like the nature of popular nationalism suggests that like if leaders are pushed toward a conflict because of popular nationalism, they have to win that war, because. Political stakes are so high, and nationalism is often tied to uh, political legitimacy. So, if leaders lose that war, then it will be a total disaster. So, for example, like between ta uh, Taiwan and um, China, what if like Chinese leader lose a war um, over Taiwan? The same thing uh, for like the South Korea and Japan relations. What if South Korean president lose a war over Tokyo Islands? That will be a total Poor disaster for political leaders. So there, there is really high stake for like a nationalist war. So my claim is that leaders want to like jump into such a, a nationalist war only when they have strong belief that they can win that war. But as you know, like having full confidence in um, in winning is very difficult. So. That can, I mean, play a role. As, I mean, the very fact that like estimating uh, a winning is hard um, can play a like restraining role uh, for readers. And secondly, we often forget, but leaders have some means to like cool down popular nationalism. Like in authoritarian regimes, they have um, media control, and then also. They have repressive means to deploy, and usually, like people think that democratic legends do not have such a tool. But in many cases, like democratic leaders have also some room, um, some room for maneuver. Um, so they they can exert like influence over um, over the media or. They can set up like different like domestic agendas so that they can divert public attention to different agendas at the moment. So it's conventional wisdom that um, nationalism pushes like leaders into more hostile reaction and and into a war. But um, my book project is trying to point out that. That is actually very, very rare if we look at history. So, so my takeaway, I mean, for you guys about the like what's going on between um, South Korea and Japan is, and also like Japan and China is that probably in the future, popular nationalism is unlikely to be a driving force um, of war between between these nations. I mean, yes, you can. Um, you can like fan like escalation of like low level disputes, but it's very very unlikely that uh, like popular nationalism um, to be a cause of um, interstate war in the region. So I'm happy to yeah answer any questions if you have. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ko, and our next speaker is uh, Peter Scott. The floor is yours. Great, thank you uh, for having me. So I also come from a, a somewhat different academic background uh, and got into sort of the, the area of Korea maybe almost accidentally. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, my, my postdoc for all the research at the University of Michigan has been in uh, computer security. Um, and I, I taught uh, a variety of computer science classes at uh, the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology in the falls of 2013, 14, and 15. Um, and, and so the, the, the core of my work is sort of technical network measurement 
and understanding online censorship and information controls. So trying to understand how quickly we can learn what content is being blocked where, and if from policy changes you can quickly learn that that has been changed. Um, it turns out that that's not actually particularly useful in the North Korea context. Uh, there's very minimal uh, content censorship technically, uh, and, and the access uh, limits or the information controls are primarily implemented sort of societally in terms of who has access to a computer, who has access to a computer that's connected to the internet. Um, and that's actually true in many of the most repressive places that we've seen. Um, that, that there's not necessarily a strong technical censorship. Uh, it's rather um, societal. Um, so, so rather than go like too deep into you know how network measurement systems work, I'm, I'm going to try and pitch this more up towards the Korea side um, and talk a little bit about what life is like uh, at Boost, um, and then a little bit about sort of what we got. I think the the two high-level metrics that are maybe most interesting to look at. Um, one is trying to understand technical capacity um, and, and how North Korea, uh, where it sees its limitations and how quickly it's investing to, um, to build up internal capacity technically. Um, and, and the other one is how that internal technology is providing uh, a, an individual sphere that hasn't existed, that, that people have personal ownership of smartphones and tablets uh, that gives them a place for personal photos, that's giving them some additional uh, flexibility to move. And so being able to understand how much of that's real and how that balances with increased surveillance uh, and that interplay um, is, is going to be important to understand if there's a change in dynamic um, and, and if there's you know any change in population dynamics. Um, so 2013 was sort of the, the first um, Ari Rong smartphone had just come out in Pyongyang. So uh, when we were there, we would see on the street occasionally uh, people with, with smartphones, but it was quite uncommon. Uh, and in contrast, by 2015, pretty much every student had a tablet with them. Uh, almost everyone you saw walking around Pyongyang had a smartphone. Uh, the, the, it really, the, the city changed in those two years. Uh, most of those devices were coming from Chinese OEMs uh, and were getting sold in the country. Um, and, and that came with it, this, this real need of now we've got these devices, but there needs to be software on them and it needs to be vetted. Um, and so within, the, within Boost, the, uh, one of the major uh, things that we were getting from the administration was we needed to be training the computer science students in, in writing and understanding Android applications, uh, both to be able to, to take um, Chinese or other uh, Android applications and change them so that they could be appropriate for the local market or to, to develop their own. Um, the, the other main priority that was happening in those two years was there was this, this interest in, in cloud and, and how they were going to build uh, sort of a larger technical infrastructure. So, so what were these technologies that would help to allow for an expansion or a consolidation uh, and processing of data? Uh, both of those being really internally focused on their, their consumer market. I think in, in broad strokes, that was where our students were ending up. Um, was not in an externally facing role, but rather um, domestically. Um, that said, there's a bunch of limitations that they were facing. Um, a lot of this is um, coming from constraints that were within the society. So the school was quite closed off. Uh, and so it's really hard to uh, be doing research in cloud computing when the students don't have access to a cloud. Um, or, or any external resources. So, so you know, um, the, the teachers had access to the internet, but the students uh, were quite constrained, and we, we had a lot of trouble getting them really more than you know, a, a, a single like, rack of computers and an internal thing that we could simulate, but, but they weren't really able to scale in a, in a meaningful way. Um, the other side of that is that you know, there continue to be power distribution issues. There would be quite a bit of time where you know, the power would be out, maybe a quarter to a third. Um, and going back to my research, one of the things that you actually are able to do is uh, power outages allow you to correlate uh, when the North Korean IP space goes down to, to uh, a power outage. You also see a lot of Chinese IPs that go down at the same time, and you can learn, use this to learn the additional uh, network presence that North Korea has but is, is not advertising uh, fully. Uh, and maybe as a commentary, that's also a reason why you would expect um, that North Korean cyber attacks are not coming from within the country, 
uh, that, that these attacks that require relatively tight timing, um, given an unstable power and, and internet infrastructure domestically, you, you'd much rather have happen someplace with a, with a more stable infrastructure. Um, I guess the other, the other thing that I can say is, is uh, in the last couple of years since I've been out of the country, I continue to look at, at devices and, and the software artifacts that are coming out um, or that are being developed for the internal consumer technology. Um, one of those um, things that I think is really an interesting commentary on uh, how much resources are going into this uh, is looking at the textbooks that they're translating and making available within their curriculums. Um, so I think it was at the end of 2017, uh, I released um, something like two or 300 computer science textbooks from the internal North Korean market. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting there is they've been translated into Korean uh, primarily from English language textbooks uh, all within a year of uh, publication. So there's, there's significant capacity in technical translation that, that's happening in-house uh, from, and this was from about 2002 to 2012, uh, where they, they have the capacity to take at least a couple uh, quite technical computer science textbooks and get them translated to then be training internally on them. Um, and I think we don't necessarily uh, give enough credit for that capacity. Um, yeah, so I think we can probably that. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, speaker is Benjamin Young. I think uh, you can present in Korean. <laughs> oh no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm severely jet lagged, so I don't think you okay. want me to, to do that. Um, so thank you for having us here, uh, Dean Kim. And um, so currently I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the U.S. Naval War College, but I'm actually moving next week uh, with my girlfriend to South Dakota, and I'm beginning a new job at Dakota State University. So I think I'm going to be the only Korea scholar in the entire state of South Dakota, <laughs> or North Dakota. Has anybody ever been to North South Dakota? Oh, really? I recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, be in Seoul, and uh, before I go to a place where uh, I think one neighborhood in Seoul has more people than the entire population of South Dakota. So, um, but my research, I'm finishing up a book on uh, North Korea's relations with the Third World during the Cold War era. So I'm a trade historian, uh, but I'm kind of slowly becoming a political scientist, uh, going to the dark side, Victor. And uh, um, so my basic argument is that Third Worldism has been part of North Korea's national identity. And uh, what I mean by Third Worldism is a commitment to anti-imperialism, uh, and a belief that self-reliance and um, is should be the core of your identity. And uh, I use sources from all around the world, Russian sources, South Korean diplomatic sources, U.S. diplomatic wires, uh, Romanian diplomatic ar archival documents, Polish, Swedish. Um, I've even done some interviews with African students who studied in North Korea. And what I really try to get at is, what does North Korea mean to you, being from the non-Western world? And they have a very different conception of North Korea, uh, especially during the Cold War era. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that North Korea was ahead of South Korean economic development up until about the mid-1970s. And the three things that they really thought North Korea was great at was social control, um, rapid industrialization and regimentation. So if you're a third world country and you're, you've dealt with violence uh, from the colonial period and you have a leader who's autocratic, if you're looking for models, North Korea actually looks pretty decent. Um, so, and North Korea really capitalized on this. So they sent, uh, they sent actual, actual large amounts of aid to third world countries. They built statues in African countries, they built schools, they sent works of Kim Il-sung to countries. Uh, they even put advertisements in African newspapers, for example. And so I have some really interesting uh, anecdotes in my upcoming book about how uh, third world peoples would sometimes use North Korean enthusiasm against North Korea, and so they would just swindle North Korea, they would just take their money. Um, and sometimes North Korea just 
due to the fact that it's relatively isolated, they didn't know this. And so North Korea spent large amounts of money on lobbying efforts in the third world. One estimate says they spent more than $100 million by 1982 on lobbying efforts in, in the third world. So uh, I'll just give you one brief case study so that we can open it up for discussion is, um, has every, any, everybody heard of the mass games in North Korea, the huge choreo mm -hmm. choreography? Uh, so they actually exported that to the third world. Uh, so there are there are mass games in Somalia. There are mass games in Idi Amin's Uganda. There are mass games in um, Togo, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and they actually still are going on in Zimbabwe. But the mass games are really a form of North Korean soft power. So we always think of South Korea as an export of soft power, of how you and K-pop and all that, but. In some respects, Kim Il-sung was actually the originator of this kind of Korean soft power. It's just, instead of BTS, you get the mass games. Um, uh, it's, it's just um, a different way of looking at North Korea. And uh, this kind of model of North Korea as being a developmental example is no longer available. But a lot of these countries still maintain ties with North Korea. And I think a lot of this, a lot of this is based on uh, historical experiences, solidarity, um, and yet you can't just cut these ties off with sanctions. I think there is some really deeply rooted historical linkages there, and I don't think the U.S. government understands that, and I don't think the South Korean government understands that as well. So um, that's kind of the general synopsis of my research. Thank you, Benjamin. Okay, now we have uh, listened to uh, all of those uh, five speakers. Uh, if I may, let me introduce uh, their counterparts, if I may. Huh? Uh, we have some uh, new PhDs, uh, starting from uh, Dr. Soon Lee uh, here at uh, you know, GSIS, and uh, Dr. Min Sung Kim at Ilming uh, International Relations Institute, and uh, Dr. Uh, Sun Kyung Che uh, at University of North Korea. Uh, studies. Anybody else's? Okay, and we have uh, some PhD candidates. Uh, my former student, uh, you know, uh, Hyungjun Byun at University of Chicago, uh, kind of a academic rival of Georgetown, uh, <laughs> and uh, many others. You know, the KU GSIS uh, PhD students and the graduate students, uh, undergraduate students, uh, all of them. Uh, over here. So, you are free to choose any questions uh, to those speakers. Okay, now the floor is open. So, if I may, uh, let me give uh, the first uh, opportunity uh, to those uh, counterparts of our, you know, Dr. Lee? Sorry. Yeah. Morning. Um. <coughs> My name is Su Hun Li. Uh, I'm a research professor at DIS, Division of International Studies. So the counter attack begins. <laughs> so um, my uh, specific focus on my study is the uh, American foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy during the George W. Bush. Uh, professor Victor Chang was part of it. And specifically, <laughs> especially on the 9-11 uh, and the war on terror, how the decisions were made by George W. Bush and his cabinet for the war on terror. And in that regard, I think uh, Dr. Chiyoko has similar studies uh, using the national sentiment and the leadership of the uh, president. So according to my research, uh, I'm looking at the executive dominance in foreign policy making. So during the international uh, environment is at risk for uh, American uh, uh, international setting, the, the uh, pendulum of power swings to the White House, the president, and when, the, when there is a peace, the pendulum swings back to the Congress. And that's the theory of many scholars before who made their research on the George W. Bush and his cabinet. And in that regard, there, there are some uh, bureaucratic and organi organizational process where the uh, decisions are made so the cabinet and also the VP and also the including the scholar academia like Victor Cha was part of it. 
So when these are made, I think there are different variables into it. And one of, one of them is this national senti sentiment, right? So after 9-11, uh, American citizens and their uh, uh, hatred and their fear against uh, uh, Al-Qaeda was too high where there were, uh, I think, I believe during 2001, uh, their, uh, the voting and the popular vote for the you know, George W. Bush was above 94%, and that actually gave the drive to George W. Bush to engage war on terror. That's what I believe in my research. And in that regard, how do you, how do you uh, assess the uh, cognitive uh, way, the method for the uh, George W. Bush in that regard? I'm sure there are some psychological stuff in it where he's making decisions and how those psychological uh, decisions are made. And to do that, you will have to know the, you really have to assess the uh, personal character of George W. Bush. So in between the national sentiment, how he becomes the drive for the George W. Bush, I think uh, there needs to be another variable that really need to be taken care of where George W. Bush should be assessed in his character and how he was raised from the very beginning of his uh, political career, where he started from George H. W. Bush's uh, campaign and how he was built up as a politician and how he became who he was during 9-11-2001. Uh, so do you take that variable into your research when you link that national sentiment and how it became a drive for the George W. Bush making his decision on the war on terror? So if that is a part of your research, I want your uh, feedback or suggestion on how you do and conduct your research. Thank you very much. Maybe that question is directed to Dr. Katz, right? Okay, uh, leave it at that way. And, uh, uh, you know, I will collect uh, some, some, some questions. Uh, Dr. Che, do you have any comments or questions? No, why don't you, you know, turn on the microphone? Yes. Now come closer to the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing in-depth interviews with North Korean refugees who have um, used the cell phones. And my question is how the use of usage of cell phones, and including the um, smartphone, uh, is, is this use is impacting on the social relations and change of the every life and that's my question. Thank you. If I add to that, you know, uh, how do you assess the impact of, uh, you know, the cell phones uh, on the life of the, the people on the border area? I, I don't think uh, it is not that meaningful to talk about Pyongyang citizens. They are, quote unquote, special people. Okay, we need to discuss the impact upon the, 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 the people on the border area or outside the uh, Pyongyang uh, area. Okay. Min Sung? Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Min Sung Kim from Illumin International Relations Institute. Uh, I have a questions related to the Dr. Katz and Dr. Goh's uh, comments related to the current Japan RK relations. Uh, especially I, I want to hear some details about the Dr. Katz solutions to this de-escalate the uh, kind of these tensions. Uh, symbolic concessions can be a temporary remedy rather for the, uh, for the long-term uh, measure. So we can get another conflict pattern sooner or later. But right now we need uh, at least those kinds of measures. And people say in Korea nowadays, this is the period like the set movement, independent movement nowadays. It's getting worse and worse. And it seems uh, really hard, as you mentioned, RK has its general election next year. Abe administration also stick to the, their domestic politics. Even after the election victory, the Abe administration and with the internal gover uh, government ranking officials try to revise the peace constitution and absolutely it would be make uh, the situation worse and more complicated. 
Although there have been some understandings, as you mentioned, about how, how the economy and cold politics in Northeast Asia is getting more blurry. Uh, South Korea also has the uh, previous experience about SAD issue a few years ago, uh, linkage between the security politics and economy. We also have some kind of economic damage from Chinese economic measures at the time. So anyway, all the related countries are trying to make the negotiation framework or whole this political environment as a symmetrical structure favorable for each other. So even South Korea nowadays, you know, the, uh, the race the issue of Jusonia, sadly. So as I mentioned, that all related countries seem to their domestic concerns much more in contrast than before. So what can be your specific suggestions as a symbolic concession to de-escalate the tension or dispute between South Korea and Japan right now? And the 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympic can be one of them. And the second one is, what can be the U.S. role in easing the tensions right now? Does the President Trump have an, at least a willingness to do something for like, engaging this issue? And maybe this can be the related to the Dr. Ko's uh, mention about populist uh, nationalism, which can lead the interstate war. That sounds like a novel a few years ago, but nowadays I think it can be realistic. And and my another question is, based on my personal um, interest about the cyber security issues related to North Korea. Uh, personally, I'm pretty much interested in the uh, cyber mercenaries in the cyber security issues. Do you have any information about cyber mercenaries recruiting by the North Korea nowadays, working in the real cyberspace? If you have any, maybe that can be a good information for us. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, her question are directed to three of you, huh? uh, next to the scholars. Okay, uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Katz for answers okay. or comments. Yeah, well thank you for these um, very good questions and comments, um, things that I've thought about as well and um, don't have complete answers to yet, but I'll give you some thoughts that I have on these issues. Uh, one on the leader, the, the question of leadership and the role of leaders, it's a really good one. It's, um, I don't know, to use academic speak, a levels of analysis issue, right? Um, I think it's always important to consider all the levels of analysis and the roles that they're playing, from structural to kind of state level to domestic level, and as you, you mentioned, the very important role of individual leaders, um, of course, plays a role in, in um, cycles of contention. Um, for my own work, uh, you know, and even in the most recent round, there's a lot of comments on how this is a perfect storm because look at Moon's background, President Moon's background, and Prime Minister Abe's background. And the depressing thing about that for me is that, well, we have to sit this out then until these leaders are no longer in office, and that's a really long time given the pace of things. So it doesn't give you much agency to act and to do something other than changing leadership, which these are democracies, that's not necessarily going, you know, it could happen, but it's not going. Uh, likely to happen, right? Um, so uh, I do think it, it has an impact, but in my own work, um, I look at the same leaders having different stances on nationalist issues, stoking up nationalism and then not. Um, Im Young Bak, towards the end of his term, stoking up the doctoral issue very visibly. Um, I, the, the general pattern in, within Korea is by the end of a term, you know, going kind of using the anti Japan card quite a lot. So problematic from the standpoint of looking at it as a consistent factor, but it definitely plays a role. Um, you can't rule it out, but uh, if I, I try to look at things that over time are consistent across, uh, across different administrations, and you find that as well. You find similarities across different leaders acting the same way, and for me, look, responding to similar domestic pressures in the same way, and that's what I try to take out to, to show a kind of consistent factor across cases, so that might be useful for other cases in other countries and that sort of thing. So that's how I thought through it in my own work, um, not to discount the importance of it, but that's kind of what my findings have shown there. Um, very good questions and, and, and observations about hot economic cold politics. For a very quick, uh, I guess, response to that, Overall, even though that's not an optimal situation, I'd like to get back to that. I'd like to get back to the, sil the siloing of these issues. Um, it's, you know, it would be better if these issues, uh, historical issues and uh, issues tied to nationalism in, in these countries could become resolved in some kind of permanent way. But in the meantime, keeping security and economic issues separate has served this region quite well, has served US interests quite well. 
Um, so uh, again, like always to strive to make it better, but the problem now is with the blurring of that. So I think it's always been uh, framed as a kind of problem, and it is a problem, but that was when things were better, and now things are getting worse, um, and I, I, I think basically because the alternatives are pretty dark. <laughs> they look like other times in history when things really, you know, alternatives like really turning inward and kind of having more nationalist economic responses to these things. I feel like we've, you know, experienced that before <laughs> in, in history in, in this region and other parts of the world. Um, so in terms of uh, specifics, I think for the United States, um, it's never been smart to, to, to really openly mediate or to try to take sides, but uh, in the interest of getting things back to kind of their places, um, to try to keep security out of the current tensions. So um, there's some discussion around Gisomia to try to keep that out of this, this you know, very heated, I mean, it's almost impossible to do, but um, to not let that get tied up uh, in, into the current economic um, dispute would be one thing. Um, and for symbolic concessions, often, as you mentioned, it's, it's events coming up that it's, it's not creating a symbolic concession out of thin air. It's kind of awkward and weird, and I don't know how you would necessarily do that. But there are things on a timeline, like the Olympics, that might be too far out, but even August 15th coming up, um, often in those times, it's things that aren't said that are important symbolically. It's, you know, if the Japanese Prime Minister is not going to say something that would be inflammatory or says something that would be helpful, it's subtleties that can make a really big difference. Um, not, again, solving things, but I think the main goal right now for Korea-Japan would is to, to stop further bad things from happening, to ease the tensions, understanding they're not gonna go away anytime quickly, um, uh, and to look out for opportunities to do that. Um, Okay, Dr. Go. Um, thank you for really insightful questions. Um, so I'd like to second like what Katrin said, ab said about the like importance of like leaders' individual characteristics and then and then like their background. Um, so I think 9/11 um, is a kind of exceptional case that popular nationalism like actually leads to a war. But I think what my project and then what I mean what I'm arguing in the project is that in those rare cases usually the public's and I mean public's national sentiments can push the leaders into war because there is relatively I mean high chance that leaders can have like accurate assessment. So in the case of like Iraq and Afghanistan war, like I'm pretty sure that like President Bush was very confident about the U.S. chance of winning in those words. So, so I think that positive assessment um, was combined with um, Bush's nationalistic tendency plus um, popular nationalism at the time, and then the decision to go to war. I think was a combination of those um, three different factors, and. And I agree with Dr. Kim that like situations are seems to be I mean situations seem to be changing nowadays, and that my argument is based on um, the continued uh, presence I mean the strong presence of the U.S. in in the um, East Asian uh, regions, because because like the U.S. Um, is in the region, it makes it hard for I mean China to accurately like assess. Um, it's real chance of like getting back to Taiwan, for example, or winning a conflict um, with Japan over Diawi and Senkaku Islands. But I mean, as we I mean are, are aware, like the U.S. It seems like U.S. is slowly like changing its position from like deep engagement to isolationism. So that leaves a possibility that like in the future, um, U.S can try to like reduce its military presence in the region. And I think if that happens, then then popular nationalism can can be more dangerous than than now. And then because that leaves um, like national leaders some more confidence that they can like take over like for example like islands by force 
and then they will dramatically like increase their political legitimacy at home because of popular nationalism. So if that happens, then I think popular nationalism can contribute to our war. Okay. Here's Scott. Sure. Um, so on, on the role of cell phones, I guess um, there's sort of two things that I would point to in terms of how I've seen cell phones changing um, daily life. Uh, one is towards efficiency. Um, so if, if you were um, trying to, to interact with some other work unit or you know, e even scheduling going somewhere else, um, that's all going to be a cell phone call at this point, right? That's not, um, you, you don't have to worry about landlines, it's, it's just a level of efficiency. Um, you'd also hear that uh, before, um, because of sort of the formalities of making a request, if you've got the person who has to make the request um, being in a, in a superior um, rank to the person they're requesting from, they can potentially lose face in doing so. And so now cell phones provide these back doors where you can uh, trigger the request to be made formally in the other direction um, and, and sort of bypass some of these potentially awkward situations. So you, would, would call your friend who's at the other work and say, oh, your, your boss needs to like call us and, and help us get this started. Um, it also, I think, gets used on a personal level for staying in contact um, with college friends, with, with previous uh, things, and so there's this stronger network that can routine compared to, you, you really, um, in, in North Korea, you live with your work unit. Like, you, you aren't going to see your college friends on a daily basis. You, like, you're lucky if you do uh, afterwards. And so, Having that network that you can still reach now, uh, who are spread across the city, um, provides just this, this much richer uh, potential personal dynamic. Um, in regards to the border area, um, so so there's there's two things, right? There's there's smuggled phones that are on uh, a Chinese network um, that that only works in a in a fairly limited physical space, right? The the cell phone networks don't uh, have coverage that far in. So you're talking about people who can either live or travel really quite close to the border. Um, so that gets used um, for things like uh, remuneration networks um, or, or communication in uh, as a relay, where there will be people who live in those areas who have both a, a phone on a, the internal network and uh, on the Chinese network and are able to act as relay points. Um, but, but that's, I mean, uh, it, it works in those relay situations, but that's not a part of daily life for that many people. One of the things you do see is uh, in the markets, it's not hard um, to get uh, black market or gray market phones. Um, so, so there is um, quite a lot of technology that's happening outside of the direct government control uh, and process. Uh, and so that's evidence of this, this continued value of that sort of connectivity. Um, on the surveillance side, uh, most of the smartphones um, when you look at them, especially in the, there was this window in 2013, 2014, where the, the first round of, maybe in the first couple waves of smartphones that came out, didn't have uh, their surveillance mechanisms particularly well implemented. And so there was quite a bit of room to potentially watch movies and potentially see media uh, on those phones uh, without too much risk. Um, most of the surveillance that happens still is going to be the same risk that someone's already going to face, that it's if someone physically comes and gets your phone, they can see what you've been doing on it. Uh, in the same way that if you had other forms of, of smuggled media, um, it, it's gonna be a similar risk. Um, the phones in, in that, I mean, even in 2015, aren't really reporting back on the network. Um, so you don't have this centralized, uh, strong capacity that's able to track you. Um, the, the tracking that you're, you're looking at is, uh, most of them have an uninstallable app called Trace Viewer that will record screenshots of, of apps and media uh, so if someone comes and wants to look at your phone, they can scroll back and see what you've been doing with it. Um, so so that, that's sort of the risk, is you've got sort of this log, um, but it stays locally on the phone. Uh, for cyber mercenaries, um, I, I think one of the important things is understanding uh, sort of the patronage of China in uh, North Korean hacking and cyber activities. Um, ben probably also has uh, some thoughts on this. But, uh, I mean, uh, there's definitely been reports of um, technical trainings in China where North Korean nationals self-identify uh, and so have been invited by the Chinese government to, to be present and, and get technical capacity there. When, when you think about a lot of the activities, a lot of them are financially motivated. Um, and, and in that case, that reconciling that with a true mercenary model um, starts to get sort of, there's a lot of questions that come up, which is, um, 
if these are just financial crimes, why isn't that mercenary just doing it purely for their own benefit? Why are they, um, you know, or so, so is North Korea going to pay them at that same rate? Well, that doesn't make sense for them if they're financially motivated. And so why then is the independent hacker not just being independent and they would get more money? Um, so, so understanding that dynamic, I think, is, is one that uh, is where that part still is. Okay. Very good. Very good.